Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up today, Dr. Neil Barnard is here to weigh in on a bombshell admission from the USDA. The safety measures currently in place to protect against salmonella at poultry plants not nearly enough to keep consumers safe. Dr. Barnard, important information coming up. Look forward to sharing that with you, my friend. You bet. Thanks, sir. And Dr. Jim Loomis is returning to the exam room live today as well. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in a big way as we close out the week. He's here to team up with Dr. Barnard to answer your questions. So go ahead and drop yours in the comment section now or tweet them to us by using the hashtag exam room live. Dr. Loomis, you ready for a little bit of everything today, my friend? Always, Chuck. Good to be here again. But before we get to any of that, let's get you caught up on the latest from the newsroom. Here are your health headlines for Friday, August 28th, 2020. We start with a new study on the coronavirus that asked the question, is six feet enough for social distancing? A growing number of researchers say you got to keep them separated even more. Research published in the British Medical Journal shows the risk for infection spikes dramatically in crowded enclosed areas and increases the longer a person is in said environment. The study finds risk for transmission is the greatest when speaking or in a room where they're shouting and singing for a prolonged period of time. But they say the risk can be reduced by wearing a mask. The study's authors say limiting the number of people allowed in confined spaces and staying more than six feet apart should be considered. And taking a look now at the coronavirus by the numbers, nearly 46,000 new cases were reported Thursday. That's 3,000 more than the current daily average. This, as health officials say, more than 1,100 lives were lost to COVID-19 as well. The death toll in the U.S. now stands at more than 180,000. And in other news, we'll be talking about this in just a moment. The USDA says current guidelines do not offer enough protection against salmonella outbreaks. The agency says current approaches in the poultry industry lack adequate measures to reduce the number of illness-causing pathogens that reach consumers. Their findings also can conclude that the surveillance of outbreaks does little to shield customers as investigations occur once people have already become ill. The agency is calling for upgraded technology to be installed at processing plants that can better calculate the risk of outbreaks. More on that in just a little bit with Dr. Barnard. And finally, a new survey finds 16% of meat-eating adults think vegans can eat meat. Yeah, I really got nothing to do with that. I got I, there's nowhere that you can go with that one. OK, uh, moving on. Time now to welcome Dr. Barnard to the show. Uh, as much as we could dissect that survey for hours on end, I think that it is best that we do cut our losses there and do our best to educate people moving forward. Uh, Dr. Barnard, um, thank you for not being part of the 16 percent. Yeah. Uh, I wanted I want to talk about something far more important, and that is that bombshell admission from the USDA that the measures in place against salmonella now just not enough to really cut the mustard, so to speak. What else can you tell us about this? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's, it's important to remember that uh, when people are eating chicken, chickens are live animals. They have intestinal tracts. The intestinal tracts are removed at slaughter. The feces that are in them contain salmonella very often, and they splatter around from one bird to another. Um, so it's no surprise that it's challenging for the, uh, the slaughter plants to be able to control salmonella. Now they try um, and they have a cooling bath uh, where the car that the carcasses go into um, as they, uh, after slaughter to cool down the, the body. But that ends up actually being a way of sharing salmonella from one bird to another. So uh, and let's, let's actually back up. I wanna show you some slides because I wanna talk about chicken just as is it a health food or not? Um, can you see this here? I want to I want to walk you through cholesterol and saturated fat in various foods. You seeing my screen there, Chuck? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So let's start with beef. Uh, beef has cholesterol. 
it has saturated fat. That's the bad fat that's linked to heart disease and linked to Alzheimer's disease. And it's in chicken with the skin, without the skin, it's in salmon, it's in cheddar cheese. And if you look at plants, there's a lot less. Okay, so let's go back to chicken on the list. Chicken with skin and chicken without the skin have a lot more uh, cholesterol and saturated fat compared to everything at the bottom of the screen. The beans, the rice, the broccoli, the sweet potatoes, all foods and plants have effectively no cholesterol at all and extraordinarily little saturated fat. It's true that when you take the skin off the chicken, you do cut the saturated fat from 3.8 down to two uh, grams per serving, that's good. And if you threw away the meat along with the skin, you get rid of the rest of that saturated fat. Here's the point, that chicken is a lot more like beef than it is like broccoli, okay? Uh, and when we look at all the things that animal products do not have, they don't have fiber. They don't have vitamin C, but for comparison, plants have lots of both. And so chicken is right up there with beef and fish and dairy products and eggs in the zero uh, category. It doesn't have fiber, it doesn't have vitamin C. Okay, um, fomite uh, is, is a word that we're hearing people use nowadays because a fomite means an object likely to carry an infection. So if you get into your Uber car, and you touch the, the passenger handle or the window crank, you're thinking, uh-oh, that's a fomite. That could have an infection if the previous passenger had germs that could get there. Well, chicken can be a fomite. Uh, that's right. These are E. coli bacteria. And uh, we talked about this a couple times on the show, but just for people who might have missed it, researchers have looked at the cause of urinary tract infections, UTIs. And you can take the bacteria that cause the infection, can send them to a lab. You can take the DNA fingerprint of those E. coli bacteria. And then you can try to figure out where do those bacteria come from? Did they come from the soil? Did they come from a pork chop or where do they come from? Well, researchers have shown that about 70 or 80% of urinary tract, uh, tract infections originated in one place, and that's a chicken package. So the chicken's intestinal tract that we were talking about earlier has feces in it, their intestines are ripped out, the feces mix in the cooling bath and they spread around to the other packages. Then you get the chicken home and the chicken, unbeknownst to you, has uh, salmonella on it or E. coli or other bacteria, not necessarily from that original chicken, but it's a fomite, uh, meaning it's transmitting bacteria that came from some other bird or, or whatever, okay? So uh, chickens are slaughtered very rapidly, sometimes as many as three per second uh, on, on farms. And then when we get them home, these are fomites, okay? So the CDC and OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration said in July, recent studies indicate that people who aren't showing symptoms can spread the virus. And it may also be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it and then touching their mouth or nose or possibly their eyes. So the idea isn't that chickens are sneezing uh, or coughing or that they have uh, the virus, but if you're in the slaughterhouse and you have sick people and they are spreading the virus through the air onto the chicken packages and you get it home, then along with the salmonella and along with the E. coli, there may also be uh, the COVID-19 virus there. So can you spell fomite? There it is. So Chuck, I hope I have cheered you up today. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you definitely did. Uh, I was not expecting the uh, spelling quiz at the end there. That's fantastic. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Wow. Uh, my question to you is this. So in the USDA report there, they, they said that uh, they, they wanted to improve technology to catch these cases. And then you made the point that there are something like millions of chickens that, that go through. And at the speed of the lines that these operate, it's just to me, it seems impossible to catch everything that's going to slide by and eventually reach consumers uh, in, in the grocery store. I mean, is there any technology possibly that could really help in this in this situation? I mean, it seems to me like you're going to need something a million times more sophisticated than Siri or Alexa to even begin to combat situations such as this. Or is the better option really just to 
take meat off the table altogether. Uh, yeah, just, just so you understand the numbers, Americans eat a million chickens per hour. So this, yes, the slaughterhouses are whizzing by and the inspectors will look at them, but it's a visual inspection. Salmonella are invisible. You, you, you can't see them. You can't see the, the, the coronavirus. It's too small. So could you identify it? Yes, if you send the, the meat to the laboratory. And then a week later, they tell you uh, about what they found. But by that time, that chicken is wrapped up and sold and has been eaten by somebody. So do they routinely test for them for these bugs before they send the product out to consumers? No, they don't. Uh, now, what we have uh, asked for, and in fact, on August 12th, I think it was, of, of this uh, month, we have filed a lawsuit against USDA to ask them to test for COVID-19 uh, in meat products. Now, th they're not going to be able to stop it from going to consumers, but what they can do is that plants can test at least some of their packages. And so you might know, okay, the Sioux Falls uh, slaughterhouse has X amount of COVID-19 being uh, uh, leaving with the pork chops and the, the Arkansas slaughterhouse uh, has X amount of COVID-19 going out with the chicken. Um, they, they don't have any numbers like that now because they're just not testing at all. And we are saying, if you're going to test, at least look to see uh, which plants are the dirtiest and which are less dirty. But, but no, they, they, there is no testing that is going to stop it from getting to the consumer. The testing hopefully would just identify hot spots. Mm. Well, that kind of makes you rethink that barbecue, doesn't it? Goodness <laughs> gracious. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Barnard, stick around here because it is time to open up the doctor's mailbag. And that means it is a Friday diet and nutrition free for all. So anything that is on your mind, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now you can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. And now let's invite Dr. Jim Loomis to join us uh, on the show. He's going to be teaming up with Dr. Barnard to so go ahead and post your question. Uh, but Dr. Loomis, before we get going here, congratulations. Congratulations are in order because James Wilkes just a couple of weeks ago said it appears that the Game Changers will become the most watched documentary yeah. in history. And you played a big role in that. So a tip of the hat to you, good sir. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, very, I think I think it, the number you quoted was like 100 million views worldwide or something like that, which is really amazing. And in fact, um, I saw two or three patients this week, new patients who, who converted to a plant-based diet solely based on watching that that movie. So it's had such an impact, not only on helping athletes understand, you know, we don't need protein to be big and strong, but 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 just people in general. These are these are people that just want to be healthier and and, and um, so so really, it, I, I have to say, really amazing, and I feel blessed to be part of that project. Yeah. And, and speaking with one of the film's producers, she was also telling me that the numbers are just extraordinary in China in terms of viewership, how many people are watching that documentary right now. And it's really going to change a whole lot of lives. And that coincides with what, you know, Dr. Jia Zhu tells me all the time when he's on the show, just the appetite for plant-based diets and information about them is so ravenous over there right now. It's, it's really, it's game changing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag right now. Dr. Loomis, the first question comes to you. And this one comes to us from a heart attack survivor by the name of Shane, who is looking for some advice. He writes, I just had my eight month checkup after a Widowmaker heart attack. I had four stents put in and have been eating a whole food plant-based diet ever since. My weight dropped 50 pounds and my cholesterol has also fallen from 235 to 144. But I'm on statins and asked my doctor if I could stop taking them. But he said, if I did, my cholesterol would go up and the pills also help with heart health. He said there is no cure for heart disease. His question to you is this, should he be looking for a new doctor that embraces the idea of eating a whole food plant-based diet? Well, first of all, congratulations on the improvements on your health and and, uh, and, and after you transition to a plant-based diet, I know how hard that can be to kind of unwind decades worth of attitudes toward food and, and, and to really uh, embrace a whole food plant-based diet and, and congratulations on accomplishing that. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and, and it's one I hear all the time. Um, so, you know, when we think about the treatment of cholesterol, um, you can kind of divide the strategies into two categories. Uh, we have primary prevention, which is uh, people have high cholesterol. We're trying to prevent a future heart attack. And then we talk about secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is people that have already had a heart attack or a stroke. We're trying to prevent a future one. Um, 
the, the, the research around primary, the primary prevention of, of heart attack with, uh, by treating people with statins is, is much less robust if you look at, at, at relative risk, risk reduction in, um, in, in, in patients than the data for secondary prevention. And, and I think the data for secondary prevention is pretty compelling that people have had a heart attack or had a stroke probably do need to be on statins for the long run. And, and there's two, two reasons for that. Uh, one is we really want to keep the LDL cholesterol super low, um, ideally less than about 75. Um, now you can certainly accomplish that with a whole food plant-based diet. Um, but in, in, as you've experienced um, with, with in, in your own personal um, health, as you notice that marked reduction in your cholesterol, which we oftentimes see. But there's also um, evidence that, uh, that statins may independently, in fact, improve vascular health. Um, so what happens with a, with a, when, we, when, we, when people develop blockage and have a heart attack is you develop this, this plaque this buildup of kind of gruel underneath the endothelium and the endothelium is the inner lining of the, of the, of the blood vessel. And, and um, as that plaque enlarges, it can rupture. There's a cap on top and that plaque ruptures and some of that gruel kind of oozes up and you get a blood clot that forms on top. And that's actually what causes the heart attack. And what the research suggests that statins may help stabilize it may activate some enzymes called collagenases, which, which uh, make collagen. And, and, the, and it may help stabilize that plaque to keep it from rupturing in the future, um, um, which can decrease your risk for heart attack. So now, you know, statins do have side effects. They can cause muscle achiness and they can cause um, liver issues, um, you know, things like that, which are typically monitored for. But I think in a situation like this, um, um, and, and you're on it, by the way, a super, a, a really the lowest dose of statin you could be on. And, and so for my patients at least, and I think most cardiologists, even the plant-based preventive cardiologists would agree that in a situation like this, where you've had a heart attack, you've had stents, they're probably staying on a low dose of statin. The, the, the benefit of that probably does outweigh the risk o- over the long run. All right, Dr. Barnard, next question comes to you. This one is from Edith. She writes, how much fiber is recommended for toddlers being introduced to foods after stopping breastfeeding? These things up. Um, the thing to do with your, your, your child is not to use a fiber supplement. Um, the fiber is naturally in the foods that you're going to provide. So if your child has some brown rice or some fruit or some vegetables, these carry some fiber naturally with them. Um, with every bite they eat. So there, there's no need to, uh, to add it up. Uh, if you feed your, your child animal products, keep in mind that they don't have any fiber at all. So as long as your child is getting a plant-based diet, uh, your child will get plenty of fiber in just the right amount. Um, one other point though, you didn't ask about this, but I do want to emphasize that when children are on a plant-based diet, they do need vitamin B12. Luckily it's in all of the, not only in the prenatal vitamins that you might take, it's also in Flintstones and all the pediatric multiple vitamins too, but don't forget the B12. Dr. Loomis, next one comes to you. This one is from High Carb Diabetic on Twitter. Interesting name. Why would I still be experiencing digestion issues with certain legumes after eating them regularly for months? So um, some people um, have issues with gas and bloating uh, with legumes. And so the beans, what, what, what happens is there's oligosaccharides, which is just a fancy name for types of the starch or sugar that are on the outside of the beans. And, and, and when they get passed into the colon, sometimes with undigested, they get fermented by certain bacteria. And so typically this is more of a problem. It's not really so much a bean problem as it is a gut bacteria problem. Um, and, and so, um, and it can take really, um, months sometimes to, to, to develop a truly healthy gut bacteria, even after you've transitioned to a plant-based diet, you know, if we could, if we could design an environment, um, to, to disrupt the human gut microbiome, we've done it right. I mean, babies are born with a sterile gut. They have a vaginal delivery. That's their first dose of bacteria. We breastfeed. That's our second dose of bacteria. The re- and the rest of our lives, we got our food out of the dirt. We played in the dirt. We drank water that had bacteria. And so we were constantly kind of replenishing our this healthy gut bacteria. We fast forward to the modern world. 
you know, we C-section babies. We don't breastfeed anymore. We put so much, so many poisons in the dirt that we have to scrub all the dirt off our vegetables, um, you know, because of the pesticides and herbicides. We, we've polluted the water. Um, so we have to put chlorine to kill the bacteria. And on top of that, we pass out antibiotics like they're candy starting at a young age. And unfortunately, although the back, back, uh, antibiotics can be life-saving, they can't tell the difference between good bacteria and bad bacteria. So people that have taken a lot of bad antibiotics through their lifetime, um, um, can, that can disrupt the gut bacteria. And there's other medications like the anti-acid medicines, the proton pump inhibitors like uh, Prezolol and, and Nexium and Prevacid can also disrupt gut bacteria. And so... Um, so th there's a couple things. So as far as restoring gut bacteria, it's important to, to eat a lot, you know, beans, in fact, legumes have soluble fiber, which serves as a prebiotic to, 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 to help um, uh, promote the growth of healthy gut bacteria. So that's important to continue to eat prebiotic foods. Um, fermented foods as well, things like pickles and sauerkraut and, 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 and kimchi have live bacteria that can help facilitate it. There's not as much data around using probiotics to help um, uh, replenish gut bacteria, but but for some patients, I, I may do that for a bit. And in the short term, um, there are a couple of products. There's one called Beano, which is actually uh, is a, is a little powder you put on the beans, and it, it has a lac it has an enzyme that helps you kind of pre-digest some of those sugars before they get into the cola. Also, washing your beans um, uh, thoroughly will wash off a lot of the, the, the um, oligosaccharides that are in the cooking water and such as that, which may help as well. So, All right. Next question in the mailbag. Dr. Loomis, sticking with you here. This one comes to us from Bree. She writes, I prefer raw veggies over cooked veggies. Is there any harm in eating them daily, including a variety of green veggies? That one is from 1208. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, um, th there's a lot of people ask the question, you know, do you lose nutritional value by cooking vegetables or conversely, do you gain nutritionally value when you cook them? So is there, do you sacrifice? And it turns out it's, it's uh, um, um, cooking activates some compounds that, that make the, 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 the veggies more healthful, but it may deactivate some, some vitamins and minerals as well. So tomatoes, for example. Uh, their tomatoes have a, pro, a, a compound called lycopene, which is an antioxidant, a polyphenol antioxidant. And it's been shown to, to uh, for example, potentially lower the risk for prostate cancer. Um, when we cook tomatoes, the lycopene content goes up, right, which is a good thing. But some of the vitamin C, which is also a healthful part of tomatoes, um, actually goes down. Um, same thing with things like broccoli and cauliflower. Some of the compounds that are anti or cancer fighting improve when you cook it, but you lose some other nutrients. So, you know, the strat I think a, a good strategy is to do both. Um, you know, have big, a big salad with, with fresh fruits and veggies in it that are raw, but, uh, but also um, include some cooked vegetables. Um, so you're really getting kind of both ends of the spectrum of the nutrition. You're getting the nutrition uh, that comes with eating raw vegetables, but you're also getting the nutrition, that, the, the enhanced nutrition that comes with when some vegetables get cooked. All right, Dr. Barnard, coming your way for this next one. There it is. Uh, this one comes to us from Lorraine on YouTube. She writes, I tend to have a lot of sweet cravings. How can I decrease them? Oh, okay, sweet cravings. Well, first of all, sweets aren't by definition terrible. Um, for example, if you take a nice crisp apple or an orange, these things are sweet, but they're not going to do you any harm. In fact, the more uh, fresh fruit you have, the better, really, um, within any kind of reasonable limit. Um, I think what you might be thinking about is sweets like candy and cakes and pie. And, and there what you've got is the sugar that's added to something that really can be um, unhelpful in, in other respects because of all the fat and stuff that's, that's packed in them, plus of the fact that you just don't need all that extra sugar. Um, a, a couple things I think are, are worth thinking about. First of all, uh, have breakfast, uh, because if you are hungry, say going into work or going about your errands in the morning, you are much more likely to be set up for cravings than if you had had a healthy breakfast first. And if your breakfast is a low GI breakfast, that's the glycemic index. Um, that means you're eating sh foods that don't raise your blood sugar too much. That's an advantage too. If you eat foods that raise your blood sugar too fast, 
white bread, white bagel. Your blood sugar goes up and then it starts coming down and it's during that downward time that the cravings kick in, especially sugar, sugar uh, cravings. If you had a big bowl of oatmeal, something like that, that's gonna help. Make sure you get a good night's sleep uh, because if you are unrested uh, at, at night, you are gonna wake up in the morning and you're, you'll do anything just to get through the day, including eating all kinds of junk food. And to help you to get a good night's sleep, good to exercise regularly. So one thing kind of leads to another. Um, and finally, um, it's useful to think about if sweets really do um, have become a big part of your life, you might decide to not tease yourself with them by having them a little bit. You might decide just to, to leave them out. If you are a person who can have them occasionally, um, the occasional sweet vegan cake or something like that, you know, it may not really be a big deal for you, but if it's becoming a big issue, you might decide to just create a fence and not have them on uh, as part of your life at all. Dr. Barnes, sticking with you here. Next question from 1216, Teacher Sweeney, kind of open-ended, but important nonetheless. Do you have any nutrition advice for teens? Yes, um, whether they'll take it or not is another question. <laughs> <laughs> because let's face it, when you're a teenager, you're immortal. Um, and so they will do all kinds of things, sometimes because danger is especially enticing. Um, a 16-year-old is going to want to smoke cigarettes and think about drugs and, and all kinds of other things. And uh, sometimes diet is the last thing they care about. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, the first thing is, what, it, what is a healthy diet for teens? It's basically the same as the healthy diet for younger kids and for adults. That's four food groups. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, plus you do need vitamin B12. We've talked a little bit about that. You need it for healthy nerves, healthy blood. And so if your teen is taking a B12 supplement or any common multiple vitamin, they're covered there. So if, if they've gotten that far, that's really good. Now, if they want to interpret it in the usual teen way, which is through fast food, then that's going to mean the bean burrito or the veggie chili or the veggie burger or something like that. Fair enough. Uh, that's modern life. It's probably what you're going to be able to, to live with. One great advantage teens do have is that is that is that in many families, they are really open to ethical issues. And very often, the first person who goes vegan in the family is the teenager because of the ethical issues or the environmental issues came home to them. And so uh, with, with your kids, you don't need to soft pedal that at all. Um, if, they have, if they don't eat the steak because they're compassionate for a cow, well, that's gonna protect their health as well. All right, Dr. Loomis, last one for you. And this one comes to us from Kathy Hines at 1216. She writes, I'm 66 and in my ninth week, uh, ninth week of being vegan, I take calcium with D3. Do I need the calcium? So that's a great question. So yes, in fact, you, I mean, uh, calcium needs to be an important part of your diet, um, presumably being postmenopausal. The recommendations are about 1,200 milligrams a day. However, um, there is evidence that taking your calcium in a pill, in a supplement, may actually increase your risk for heart disease. Um, and, and what happens is, is, as I mentioned in an earlier question, when we start to develop that plaque um, um, the, underneath the, the blood vessel wall, uh, underneath the endothelium that leads to heart disease, um, it's really just a big scar. And, and eventually, that scar, will, you'll start to deposit calcium in it. And that taking calcium supplements may in, in, increase, accelerate the deposition of calcium in these, in these heart lesions. Um, the good news is, is that there's lots and lots of calcium in plants and it's very easy to get calcium through, through plants. So, you know, that's one of the things that comes up if I don't drink milk or I'm getting my calcium. Well, you're going to get the same, your calcium from the same place the cow got its calcium to put in the milk and that's from the plants that you eat. Um, there's a, there's a, a good website I refer a lot of patients to called the world's healthiest food. And if you just Google world's healthiest food, calcium, It'll give you uh, it, it kind of a, it's it's evidence based, it, it, but but more importantly, it gives you a whole um, uh, a list of high calcium foods. Now it's not a vegan or plant based website, um, but what you'll see is that cow's milk is number ten or fifteen on the list as far as the best sources of calcium. Tofu being by far the best. Uh, tofu is made; it's curdled. You take soy milk and you curdle it. And the curdling agent um, historically was gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, which, which um, actually some of that calcium stays in the tofu. And that's why cal tofu is such a great source of calcium. Uh, 
but but green leafy vegetables, collard greens has more calcium per cup than milk. So so it's very easy to get plenty of calcium um, through your diet. On the vitamin D side, um, vitamin D is not really a vitamin; it's more like a hormone made in response in the sun in response to our uh, in our skin in response to the sun. Um, that is something that I recommend you have checked intermittently, and if it's low, you might need a supplement. But getting out in the sun a little bit um, typically. Um, is, is a great way to get plenty of vitamin D. Um, but again, I, I think getting your, there's evidence that getting your calcium from food is much more healthful than getting your calcium from supplements. And that's true for pretty much any micronutrient other than say vitamin B12, which can be a nutrient, as Dr. Barnard mentioned earlier, a nutrient of concern in a plant-based diet. All right. And Dr. Barnard, the very last question of the week comes to you. This one is from Braun Fit. They want to know from 12.20 p.m., can you tell me the advantage of soy and is there any disadvantage to eating it? Uh, great. Um, soy products uh, actually reduce cancer risk. That's the first thing to emphasize because a lot of people have imagined the opposite. And you will see some websites talking about soy uh, having isoflavones, which are phytoestrogens increasing cancer risk. Uh, this has been put to the test. And uh, people consuming the most soy have the least cancer. Uh, specifically, women who consume more soy milk, tofu, soy yogurt, uh, those who consume the most have about 30% less risk of developing breast cancer compared to women who avoid soy. And then women who have had breast cancer in the past, again, if they consume more soy, they have about a 30% reduced risk of their cancer coming back and, and killing them. Um, so soy is actually good there. And for men, it's similar with regard to prostate cancer. Soy reduces the risk as well. Uh, disadvantages? Um, no, but I, I theoretically, I have to always think that soy is at its very healthiest the more it looks like a bean. So when soy is edamame, you can still see the bean there. And when it's turned into tempeh and tofu and so forth, it's still mostly soy. Uh, the, the more it gets changed and transformed into soy bacon, it's still way healthier than the pork bacon or the chicken bacon by far, but sometimes they're adding more sodium and things that, that you might not need. All right. If we, if we did not get to your question today, have no fear. We will be opening up the doctor's mailbag again next week, and we will save every question that we have in the archive and try our very best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Dr. Barnard, Dr. Loomis, appreciate y'all's wisdom today on the show and as always. And listen, if you have a question that you would like to ask privately, you can always do that by scheduling an apartment, uh, appointment with the Barnard Medical Center where the doctors and dietitians can definitely work with you on achieving your health goals. Whether that's losing weight or combating diabetes, or maybe you're like Shane who asked the question earlier in the show after surviving a heart attack, they are here to help. So make your appointment today by calling 202 527 7500 or schedule that appointment by visiting barnardmedical.org. Telemedicine appointments now av available in more than a quarter of the country. A full list of states is available at barnardmedical.org. Visit that website to make your appointment today or call 202 527-7500. Before we wrap up today, uh, I really did just want to take a second to say thank you, uh, because there was a time in my life where I did not think I was going to live to see 30 years old. And today I turned 38. And what an incredible journey this past decade plus has been. And it is a privilege to be able to share uh, what I have learned and continue to learn with you each and every day here on the exam room live and certainly through the exam room podcast as well and doing everything that we do here at the physicians committee. Being able to bring that information to you is the greatest present that I could possibly ever ask for. So thank you so very much for being a part of this journey with me. And that's going to do it for us for this week. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, Dr. Barnard and Dr. Loomis and the crew behind the scenes that is fantastic and pulling this show together each and every day, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again on Monday. And until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.